Hi folks, Ryan Honeyman here from Lyft Economy. Many folks have come to us over the last 10 years and asked, how do I get more involved in creating an economy that works for the benefit of all life? They also ask, what skills and experiences do I need to help make this transition? So three years ago, we created something called the Next Economy MBA to help address this and similar questions. Lyft Economy's Next Economy MBA is an online course that's designed for entrepreneurs, aspiring entrepreneurs, students, recent graduates, employees, and folks who want to learn more about transformational next economy strategies and businesses. Join the growing alumni network of nearly 250 alumni who've gone through this program and learned essential skills and hopefully built lifelong relationships for catalyzing businesses in the emergent and regenerative economy. So we encourage you to check out our course. You can go to lifteconomy.com slash MBA. The next course, Cohort 7, starts on September 21st, 2021. So once again, go to www.lifteconomy.com slash MBA. And now, on with the show. Welcome to Next Economy Now. The goal of this podcast series is to highlight the leaders who are taking a regenerative, bioregional, equitable, democratic, racially just, and whole systems approach to creating the new economy. Welcome to Next Economy Now, Ed. Great to have you with us. Thank you very much. It's good to be here. So, Ed, I'd like to start just by hearing hearing your story, uh, your background, where you're from, and and how you got into this work. Uh, I'm originally from Little Rock, Arkansas. I grew up there in the in the 1950s. I was uh, born in '49. So, as an eight year old, I got a chance to hear uh, lynch mobs out in the street, Little Rock talking about they didn't want black children to go to their Lily White High School, and uh, the president had to send federal troops into Little Rock to. Uh, let these nine children go to school at Little Rock Central. I later graduated from that same school. Uh, Ten years later, I graduated from there in 1967 and went, um, went off to college and was pretty active in, in uh, campus politics and anti-war activity. Uh, became the head of the Black Student Organization at, at Cornell University before leaving there to come to North Carolina to work in, a, in an independent institution called Malcolm X Liberation Youth uh, University here in Greensboro, North Carolina. And from that, I went on to do labor and community organizing while working a full-time job and did that work until I retired from industry in 2009. By that time, I had run for public office a few times. I chaired the local Greensboro Redevelopment Commission for nine years and had a radio talk show, wrote a newspaper column, and worked a full-time job and raised two children and played music on the side. So uh, I've had an interesting life. Right now, I'm the co-managing director and co-founder of the Fund for Democratic Communities. I work here along with Marnie Thompson, who is the other co-founder. She had family wealth that she was not interested in holding on to individually and would have, was going to give it away. And her, her father suggested to her, since she was going to give it away anyway, that she should organize a foundation. And she asked me if I would be willing to help her do that. We had done a lot of uh, social justice work around educational reform and anti-war work for years together. I agreed to help her build this organization, and we did that in 2007. So the Fund for Democratic Communities has been around. We're going out of business in 2020 as a kind of conscious decision to sunset this organization and try to put the assets that we have um, access to back out into the communities for more direct control by the uh, marginalized communities, which ultimately are the source of the wealth that we and other foundations hold on to. Wow. That's the short version. <laughs> That's amazing, Ed. You know, I was, in preparing for this, I was reviewing, you know, the organizations you're involved with. And so I'm just, uh, I'm really surprised and impressed to hear that you had a full-time career and you were doing your, your activism on the side. What, what, what were you doing for your, your, your line of work? I have been a machinist, an electronics technician, an electronics specialist, auto mechanic, uh, and a jack of all trades around the house. Wow, amazing. So 
I worked 30 years in one factory. Before that, I'd had a number of jobs, typically for a year or two each, typically as in some technical field uh, or mechanical field as a machinist. I actually enjoy working with my hands, even though when I was in college, I was studying uh, mathematics and, uh, and philosophy. <laughs> oh, that's great. So how, <laughs> and how, how did you find the time with the family to, to do all this organizing work over the years? From the time I was small, I used to always think I would much rather be busy than bored, and I've stayed busy. Wow. Wow, that's amazing. Well, I just certainly just want to appreciate all the, the good work you've, you've been up to and, and involved with going on 50 years as a career uh, activist here. Pretty amazing. How, how have you seen things change, Ed, uh, since, since the 60s? Obviously, we're in a different scenario, but you know, what, what, what's your sense of the you know, stepping back and looking at the arc of, of everything you've been involved with? That's really kind of interesting. Uh, in many ways, some things have gotten a lot better. Some things have stayed about the same, and some other things have actually gotten worse. Hmm. I'm not sure that we've ever had a president quite as bad as the one we have now. I don't know that, that the level of street violence and the kind of impunity with which police departments can shoot people and not be prosecuted has ever been a lot worse, even though the level of violence has actually been around quite a while. Uh, what hasn't been available are uh, handheld video recording devices so that this stuff can be verified and shown to other people who otherwise wouldn't believe it had happened. Right. School public education is probably about as bad as it has ever been. I, I don't think it's gotten improved much at all. In fact, I went to segregated schools in Little Rock, Arkansas in the 1950s and 60s, up until, I, well, up until 1964, all of the schools I went to were segregated schools. I'm willing to stand before anybody and could offer evidence that the quality of education I got in those schools was better than that that was available for my children in integrated schools here in Greensboro, North Carolina. Wow. And their schooling would not have been much worse than other children across the country. I had really good teachers. Actually, it was funny that one of the things the segregation system did was it left educated black folk not very many options in terms of what they would do with their education. So a lot of people became school teachers when if other opportunities had been available, they would have been political leaders, politicians, philosophers, engineers, scientists, hmm. and they were school teachers instead. They, they taught me in, <laughs> in elementary and junior high school. So you potentially got better quality of teachers because of that? Is that what you're... Yeah. Huh. I think so. Wow. Uh, high quality teachers that actually cared in a situation where the schools were connected to the community in a way that I think is much healthier than the more distant relationship between schools and communities now. But public education is very, very difficult to reform in any kind of way. It's like uh, in, a, in a canoe and trying to nudge a gigantic aircraft carrier and make it change directions. It doesn't really want to move very easily. And it's capable of absorbing almost all of the effort you put into it. So I don't do a lot of work right now around public education. I think there's some other leverage points uh, that will more move some of the things that will actually transform education than working directly at it. That's my own personal involvement with it. Uh, many other people that I respect highly continue to try to work to reform it, but uh, a lot of them are really not getting a lot of traction. I, I hear that. So what what have you seen get, you heard your, your, you know, your remarks on some things are about the same, some things have gotten worse. Um, what, what have you seen that's gotten better? I think that that the quality of some of the uh, social justice movements, the concern, the understanding that there's probably something really actually wrong with capitalism has grown. And so consequently, there's a, the, uh, the capacity of people to start, to start building alternative institutions that have a level of stability and sustainability uh, on a very conscious basis. I think some of that is getting better right now. So there's work toward building a worker cooperative movement and other types of cooperative movements. There's work at building intentional communities. People are talking about and thinking about finding ways to build eco-villages. Um, the level of clarity around our involvement with the, uh, with the environment is, has grown among many people. So the potential to do some things about it is great because of the greater level of understanding of those things. And I heard you say you felt that addressing public education you know, head on was, was probably not the best use of, of your energy. It seems like you've taken more of an economic uh, route to, to progress. Is that correct? In recent years, yes, we have uh, 
The Fund for Democratic Communities started around the idea that we wanted to promote authentic democracy in both social justice groups and community groups. And we thought we would use our, our resources to do that. And again, the, the way that makes sense is that uh, if ultimately people's capacity to make democratic decisions and be directly involved in the things that affect their lives, that should be one of the main mechanisms toward building a more just society. I think the fundamental character of injustice is that a few people make decisions that affect the lives of, of the many for the greedy and often selfish purposes of the few. Okay. So that, again, building authentic democracy is a way that the, that the desires and the interests of the many come to the fore. As it relates to the economy, that brings us to something where we, we have stressed and think a lot about productive justice rather than just distributive justice. So it's not just a question of splitting up those things that already exist, but rather looking at the fact that how do they get to be there and how can we create opportunities for more and more people to have the chance to be fully productive and to produce for the world uh, and their communities the things that they would want for themselves. Uh, so this idea of productive justice is a little, it's not talked about very much. In fact, most economic justice thinking is about redistribution, like how are we going to share the, the, the social product as it is? Our question is, how did the social product get to be the social product? Who owns the capacity to produce? Our conclusion is that right now it's perfectly legal for a handful of people who own most of the productive assets to control what everybody else needs in order to live. It's virtually a question of life and death. If we're not able to produce the food we need, we starve to death after, after a short time. If we poison the atmosphere and the water, we'll choke to death uh, or be poisoned uh, after a short while. And if the kinds of decisions about whether or not to do that remain in the private hands of people who say that they own most of the land, that they uh, own access to the air, that they own the kinds of equipment they will either keep it clean or pollute it, and their ownership gives them the right to determine how they're utilized, then this is a system that causes undue uh, suffering and toil for the majority of the people who have in fact produced the wealth that all of us enjoy. The wealth is, is it's not magical. I mean, there's a certain amount of things that have value that are found here on Earth and the whole living surface of the planet with trees and animals, and microbes even, you know, have a kind of interactive way of providing things that are valuable to us. But typically we engage with that living surface of the planet and through our engagement with it, we can create even more value. So that everything we see around us, from the tall buildings to the airplanes to the to the satellites and the satellite communication, are all creations of human labor acting on that surface of the earth. And the benefit from that has not gone to the people that actually did the work. It's the people whose labor is is uh, kind of encased in all of everything that we see around us are not really the beneficiaries. Because again, the owners are the owners are able to extract the surplus of all of the labor that's produced by everybody. And so philanthropy, in fact, sits on that foundation. Philanthropy is kind of based on the fact that there's a lot of wealth that's produced. And so a few people will get together and decide how to dole out a tiny portion of that wealth. By law in the United States, 5%, holding on to the other 95% and letting it generate more surplus through other kinds of investments and stuff. And it's only using that secondary level of surplus to then dole out some small amounts of public good a friend of mine from a group in, in uh, Eastern Kentucky, Apple Shop, referred to it as twice stolen wealth. Mm. Uh, it's, a, it's an interesting concept. Economic justice is, to me, about the bulk of the things that people care about. A lot of the social justice issues, if you look at them at their root, become e economic justice issues because the question of what is it that either gives somebody an opportunity to do the things that they need for themselves or denies them the opportunity to do the things that they need for themselves. And indeed, when people have the capacity to do the things that they need for themselves, kind of what other people think doesn't make all that much difference. The only way I care about what other people think about me is if it restricts what I can do for myself, my community, and the people that I care about. If it doesn't restrict it, I care less what they think. Right. So if, if, if we're not uh, subjected to other constraints, we could grow our own food, harvest our own raw materials, build our own shelters, manage our own community. Build our own transportation, yeah, build a road, build the infrastructure that we need in our community for the kind of life that we care about and is of value and meaningful to us. 
have our own cultural life, cultural expression. And again, if nobody's hungry, everybody has a place to stay, and we're able to culturally engage in having a meaningful life, that sounds pretty much like freedom. Yeah. And I, I, I really appreciate this point that um, what's, what's known as, as philanthropy is, is really just an afterthought of, of extraction, right? So if we didn't extract, yeah, it, concentrate well, we wouldn't have poverty that needs a, a handout. Uh, in, in fact, right. the whole system propagates that status quo where you need to keep giving out. And as you said, just a little bit. <laughs> uh, a very small portion. Yeah. Very so now there's more and more talk about mission related investment and using the entire corpus of uh, philanthropic assets to further their mission. <laughs> I think that's easier said than done, first of all, because a lot of people are very concerned about having market rate returns and some of the more meaningful social justice investments that might be made may or may not return things at the same rate as extractive carbon based uh, energy projects, for instance. Right. The the mission investment field, though, I think opens the door for potentially shifting further assets into a level of community-based investment that is democratically controlled by the communities. And what we like to talk about is the development of a financial commons. Mm. That just as the land commons was a place available for people to graze their cattle or hunt or fish or uh, do things that enhanced their lives, uh, and it was to be shared and democratically controlled so that it wasn't squandered, wasted, or misused. Just as that existed for a physical land commons, we ought to think about how can a financial commons exist so that the accumulated wealth that was created by people in the course of their labor also becomes part of a commons and can be accessed in order to meet our needs and elevate the quality of life in our communities. So do we have any reference points for that? Yeah, the work we're doing right now in building the Southern Reparations Loan Fund that I'm the chair of the board of as a part of a, a financial cooperative is our effort at building and creating a financial commons. Hmm. Because the idea is that this is a loan fund that's part of a network of loan funds that will be sharing capital, sharing learning through a peer network of support and training, and sharing back office services so that it, uh, loan funds are decentralized that exist in local areas and can exercise local control over the allocation of assets to help build sustainable local economic activity that, again, where the repayment goes back into the local community rather than being concentrated by the, by the center. And that's the work we're doing in building the financial cooperative uh, with the support and, and uh, guidance of the working world, where I'm also on the board. And we're working along with some other people some of whom are in philanthropy. The Fund for Democratic Communities is very involved with this. We have a project that grew out of the EDGE Funders um, Convention about a year, just over a year ago, the one that was held in Berkeley, that we call Shake the Foundations, where we are trying to appeal that foundations that are interested in divesting from bad things, whether they be from fossil fuels, private prisons, or whatever, that those foundations take and reinvest that money in these community-based developmental loan funds to help create a new economy based, again, on more directly addressing the needs of people. Wow, very important. What's the, the developmental status of the, the Southern Reparations Loan Fund? Do you have a certain amount of capital, a certain amount of projects? Like, where, where are we at in that, that process? Well, right now, because we are part of this financial cooperative, we have access to the capitals available within the cooperative. So the several million dollars now that are, are available for the various loan funds that are part of this. Oh, that's great. We're looking to grow that amount of money both through uh, donations and other philanthropic investments. Uh, the Fund for Democratic Communities will be putting more of our assets into it. And as we sunset, whatever is left at the end of, the, uh, at the end of 2020 will all go into that collection of loan funds. But right now, there are other kind of social justice mission investors that are interested in, in doing it. So we're developing several prospectus, uh, prospecti, uh, I don't guess it's prospectuses, who knows. Anyhow, <laughs> investment documents are being prepared to uh, yeah. more formally make available investment opportunities. Uh, right now we are still in negotiating investment opportunities for people. And an example of the kind of projects that we're able to support with this is uh, we just opened a grocery store here in Greensboro, North Carolina called the Renaissance Community Cooperative. Now this was a 
working class neighborhood, uh, predominantly African American, that a number of experts in the food co-op field told us was too black, too poor, and too uneducated to successfully have a cooperative. Uh, we thought that was kind of ridiculous. And the store had its grand opening after about five years of work. It had its grand opening back in November. Now, this is not a, a, an easy task because now these are people in a community that hadn't had a grocery store in, um, since 1998. Huh. That's going on. 18 and a half, almost 19 years, around December 1998, when the other grocery store closed. Everybody in that neighborhood continued to eat food, which is to say that they found other places to buy it other than the grocery store in the neighborhood. And so now we're working at shifting people's habits back exactly. into buying in their neighborhood and developing this store. But we have complete faith that this effort will be successful. We're doing a kind of rebranding and developing some additional kind of marketing ideas. There are some consultants coming into town that, that are working with us. Uh, Fund for Democratic Communities has kind of worked as a developer on this project, and we're staying very, very close to it to make sure that it has the resources that it needs to be completely successful. But the Southern Reparations Loan Fund is handling a loan of $253,000, which is part of the debt financing of the store. That goes along with some other monies that were borrowed from shared capital cooperatives in uh, Minnesota, the North, North Country Cooperative Development Fund, and there was some grant funding from the city of Greensboro to the tune of $250,000 as a matching grant to match their privately held and privately raised money. There's some other equity investments in it, but they're um, disinterested, non-voting equity investments in the project. So this is you know, one of the kinds of things we're able to do. We work with some young people in Florida who are developing a clothing line. Can I pause you on the Renaissance? Because I'm, I'm just curious to 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 hear more sure, about that. Absolutely. Yeah, it's such an important story. I'd love for you, Ed. You you, you shared uh, you know some of the the people in the co-op grocery field. Uh, you know, they 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 had reasons why this wasn't a good idea or wasn't possible. Can you refute those arguments? Well, basically, the the bulk of the food co-ops in the United States right now were developed in the 1970s and 80s as natural food and organic food cooperatives, the niche that they were satisfying was the need to have places you could buy organic food. That niche has been more and more filled by a lot of people that are selling organic food now. I mean, Walmart and Whole Foods, or Whole Paycheck as it's sometimes referred to, Earth Fair, other, and even regular grocery stores, the, the Kroger's, the Harris Teeters of the world, the food lines sell natural organic food. Mm -hmm. The other thing was that in order to be those natural food markets that they were, they were selling food at a higher price um, in that niche market, which meant that they needed clientele that was higher income. So one of the factors for success in the uh, food co-op world was the number of people in the community that made between fifty dollars and $150,000 a year. Another factor for success was the number of people that were college educated. And another factor that they were using, and it was kind of questionable for me to understand exactly why they were using it was the percentage of white people was listed as a factor for success. And if you're using race as a surrogate for income, I can understand that. If you were using it as a surrogate for, uh, for level of education, I could understand it. I never quite understood why race would be listed as a separate factor when you had already listed education and income. So I didn't know if there was something about just being white that made food cooperatives, because I assure you black people do eat food. So I, don't, I, didn't, I wasn't sure what that was. I asked them, and when I asked them, they weren't sure either. It's like, well, we don't know why we said that. So, um, but in any case, it's perfectly clear that every community has the potential for having food retailing take place there. I mean, people eat, and people will do whatever they have to do in order to eat. What happens, though, is that as food deserts have grown across the United States, it means that people have been inconvenienced and have to go further away from home or find transportation or do other things to eat it. But the onus on that is going to be on the, the individual consumer. They'll have to do whatever they have to do, but they're going to have to get the food. Building cooperative ventures inside of communities is a way to make it more convenient, but also a way to retain the wealth, any surplus that is created in the course of the retailing, the retail sale of the groceries, it remains in, inside the community. Now, the grocery business is a tough business. The margins on revenues are razor thin, so you have to really, really know what you're doing. Yep. You have to be able to engage in something that's going to give you a competitive marketing advantage over the other people trying to sell food 
to the same people that you're trying to sell food to. Uh, one of our advantages is we're close. We're right in the neighborhood of the people that we're talking about working with. A disadvantage is we're not as well known. And some people were even confused by the name co-op, thinking that this meant that it was a high-priced store or that it meant that you had to be a member to shop there. And we're still kind of, you know, breaking out and going, getting past uh, those misconceptions in order to get the marketing up to and the uh, revenues up to what they need to be. Well, and we, we know um, from the recent work of our friend Jessica gordon Embhard, right, Collective Courage, that cooperation isn't actually new for black communities. Absolutely not. It, it's, it's, it was a necessary survival skill. You know, people had to work with each other, developing kind of mutual aid, mutual benefit ways of cooperating, and even building cooperative grocery stores up until the time when more commercial grocery stores started opening in neighborhoods and put financial pressure on some of the cooperative grocery store operations. But now with the grocery stores consolidating and leaving all these food deserts, right. it's created another opportunity to develop grocery as one of the kind of cooperative business centers, business hubs within the community. Can, can you touch on uh, the reparations piece of the loan, loan fund? I'm just a yeah, we call it the Southern Reparations Loan Fund because we think it's important to promote the idea that the wealth itself has come out of the community and needs to go back into the community. The loan fund is located inside the community. Somebody said, well, if it's only reparations, why should we, should we, if we borrow money, why should we have to pay it back? But if the fund is outside of the community, that would be a question. But if it's inside, then we again think of as commons that this is an act of reparations is putting money into the loan fund, making it available there. This then is acts as a revolving fund within the community so that the people who are able to access it end up leaving it in a better place than it was before so that the generations to come will still have access to financing for the projects that they, uh, they come up with and, and need to engage with. Has the fund grown over time? or We're starting, we're, we're, we're only about a year old. Um, so yeah, it's grown from not doing anything to we have um, several loans out we're working on somewhere. I just got back from a trip in Mississippi where I was talking to some people in Starkville about potentially a, a hay co-op that they're doing with several agricultural folks uh, who built a co-op there. Uh, some people in Rankin County, Mississippi that we have made a small working capital loan available to in order to start developing cattle feed and selling it to their members. There are people that I'm talking to in Jackson, Mississippi, who are interested in opening a grocery store. We're friends with the folks at Cooperation Jackson. I know them. We work with them. We're very interested in them getting some of the co-ops that they are envisioning and talking about and helping them actually get them off the ground. A lot of people sometimes think that those are a little further alone than they are. They're very, very interesting projects. There's some exciting ideas that they have come up with in terms of what they'd like to do. But it's it's a huge amount of work, and you know it's still at a very early stage. Well, what what else is going on that that, that you're involved with that you're you're excited about? Um, nothing. <laughs> or maybe you were going to talk about the Florida Dream Defenders. Okay, yeah, the Dream Defenders, another group that we're working with. They're developing a clothing line calling Rebel Thread, and uh, they've been selling T-shirts with uh, slogans on it. One of my favorite slogans on one of their shirts is, "We've been to the future." And we won. <laughs> a nice way to have hope in these troubled times that we live in now, mm. to know that at some point we win. So the, the Dream Defenders, the RCC grocery store, the working capital loan, those are the, those are the main loans that are out right now. And again, for each of them, all of them require a level of technical assistance because our repayment schedule is a little unlike other loan companies. We... Um, we're not, we engage what we call non-extractive lending. We don't accept as collateral people's personal assets, nor do we even accept their uh, previously existing business assets. So if you already have a truck and you borrow some money from us to buy another truck and you change your mind, we might take the truck that we helped you buy back and try to liquidate it and get a portion of our money back out of it. But we won't bother the truck you already had or your house or your refrigerator. And also, we only getting repayments out of the profitability of the enterprises. Right. In other words, that our, our loans are to help people in communities make some money, and our repayment comes back out of the money that it helps them make. And so this is a different kind of lending. It requires that the enterprises are, are vetted very, very closely to make sure that they do have some chance of success. And for us, that means giving people a level of technical assistance 
that help them build successful businesses. Again, for some communities where people have been denied the opportunities to engage in business thinking and figure out break-even points and know, you know, kind of the constant cost and the variable costs that have to do with increasing sales, the cost of goods. So there's some analytical work that has to be done and some projections to try to make sure that you're working on a solid business plan. And so part of our work in lending is to engage in that level of technical assistance with the enterprises themselves to help people build successful business ideas and planning to move forward. Yeah, that's a strong parallel to what we're doing with our our Force for Good fund as well, is capital along with technical assistance. And and of course, like you're saying, uh, non-extractive capital is is, uh, very important at these times. Now, another aspect of our work has to do with the development of the loan councils, where the actual vetting of loans take place and Mm -hmm. decisions are made on who to lend to. Yeah. And the idea is for this to be as broadly democratic a process as possible. Mm. So there's a loan committee that meets periodically and where loan officers come before that loan committee and argue for the, the loans and are often question is like, well, had you thought about this? And those numbers sound a little fishy. Do you really have solid projections on why you think that's going to work? And in the course of doing that, so often it will take several iterations before the loan is actually ready for lending but it helps in strengthening the businesses and making sure that we maintain a portfolio of things that, you know, have a really, really good chance of being successful. Yeah, it democratizes the lending process. And, and so this is inside the Southern Reparations Loan Fund? It is inside the financial cooperative that the Southern Reparations Loan Fund is one of the funds in. Uh, there are also some people in Richmond, California, some folk working on this in Detroit, developing a this similar is, fund. And this is the, the Working World Peer Network? Is that what it's called? Or what's the... It's called the Financial Cooperative. And the Peer Network is kind of the the uh, the shared learning section part of the uh, of the Financial Cooperative. Right. And so people from all these different regions would be on the board to approve any one investment? People from many of the different regions. The, the size of the... Uh, it's called a Sustainability Committee. It doesn't mm-hmm. include everyone, but it includes representatives from many of the different loan funds. Yeah. And then when loans are made purely with the assets that were generated within a local area, there will be a local sustainability committee as the loan funds okay. uh, move further in development. Oh, wow. Love that model. Stepping back, uh, looking looking at all the, the wonderful stuff you've been involved with, do you have any kind of wisdom you've been able to distill any any best practices uh you know that you would offer towards uh you know folks in the movement that are working on this stuff i'm a pluralist at heart which means that uh i don't often think about best practices i think about good practices sure and i think that it's important for people to try a lot of different things that resilience requires that we don't all try to do the same thing because if it turns out not to be a good idea, then everything flops at the same time. I do believe that this idea of thinking about commons thinking, the, the idea of how do we create places where, uh, where there can be democratic access to things that people need in order to, to be successful, to be happy, to again, meet their needs and elevate the quality of life. This, this question of how do we create these democratic access is a huge question. And it flies in the face of some of the notions of uh, individual ownership, mm-hmm. particularly the idea that you know, individuals have a right to own huge swaths of land. If somebody had, tells you that they have, somebody was telling me the other day that they know somebody that owns an island. I said, how did they get to own an island? They're like, well, they bought it. I said, well, who could they buy it from? I mean, who can <laughs> sell you the island that they live on? So I said, the only way anybody owns something that big is if they either stole it or they bought it from somebody who stole it. But there's something peculiar about land ownership anyway. We didn't make any of the land that we claim to own. We can work on land, and as we work it, I think we should have a right to the products of our labor on on the land. But the idea that we own the land itself is kind of weird. <laughs> um, and for, for many societies around the world, historically, there was no, no conception of, of the idea that individuals could actually own the land, which is why some of the dealings that happened between various visitors or traders where they claimed to have bought certain things, it it wouldn't have even made any sense to someone that they would sell Manhattan for $25 worth of beads. It's like, well, we use Manhattan, and you can use Manhattan. And yeah, the beads are pretty. Thank you for the beads. 
But, I mean, to find out later, oh, we can't use Manhattan anymore because we got these beads. It's like you got to be kidding. So the, the idea of creating a commons and of developing democratic access to accumulated wealth is something that I hold very, very important. And I think that much of whatever become the economic forms of a future just world and society would have to have provisions for this kind of democratic access to wealth uh, to be a very dominant feature of it. Yeah, I really appreciate that point. Uh, and we, we, you know, we've heard from First Nations, right, that, that uh, in their, their perspective, they don't know the land, the land owns them. And it's their duty to, to provide stewardship and protection for the, 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 the ecosystem as a, a whole entity, not as That's chopped right. up into trees and coal and water and separate resources, but as actual living, uh, breathing entity that deserves uh, respect. Yep. So I appreciate that as, you know, in a, in a modern uh, context, we can call it as, uh, you know, a return to the commons or create recreating the commons. Yeah, that's, that's very important. What, what, what do you see for the future, Ed? You know, you've had, you've had, you know, you shared some of your, your history and the arc of, of, of where you've come from, what you've seen, and what, what do you see unfolding next? I, I think it's going to be a lot of work. <laughs> I, think, uh, I think a lot of thinking, a lot of work, a lot of reflection on that work that will guide us to thinking even more about the, the new work that we have to do. And I think that that's all meaningful activity that we should, we should look forward to engaging in. It's sad to me that there are so many people who are injured and damaged by the existing system. Uh, but on the other hand, I've heard people, for instance, say, you know, I would never bring a child into this world because it's so bad. And I'm thinking that what has been a meaningful life for me has been to engage in things that were wrong and try to make them better. Mm. And so I don't, I would never hesitate um, that other people could engage in this meaningful act and this meaningful work along with me. I don't think we owe anybody a uh, perfection, but I think we should try to make the world as good a place as we found it and better for the generation it for ourselves. And that that's part of what gives us a meaningful life as we live it. So lots of opportunity, huh? <laughs> Lots of opportunity to engage in really exciting work and lots of work and hopefully lots of music and lots of joy as well. There it is. Might as well celebrate and enjoy, right, while we're doing the work. Right. Ed, who are you watching? I mean, you've, you've shared, again, some of your great great projects and groups that you're directly working on. Who else is out there that that you're inspired by or, you know, maybe it's, I don't know if it's a book you're reading or thought leaders or other groups, but... You know, who else would you point to to see some of these solutions unfolding? I, I think there are a lot of uh, a lot are exciting in terms of the kind of courage they exhibit. There's also a lot of wisdom that has been shared by a number of people along the, the, the way. A friend of mine named Lloyd Hogan is a, an economist, and he's 94 years old now, and he just published another book wow. a few months ago on population dynamics. Uh, and it's a book I'm struggling to understand better because it talks about the significance both of the living generations, but also recognizing that which was created by people who are currently dead, some of whom were even worked to death. And you know, I, I started trying to think, of what is the utility of understanding this? And I realized that there's no real way to understand the wealth of a community just in terms of thinking about living people, because it wasn't all created by living people. Much of it was created by people who are currently dead. Right. And so the question, who does it belong to? Uh, and, 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 you know, what are the rights of the living that grow from these things that are built, you know, on the virtual bones of, uh, mm. of those who have come before it? So, I mean, I find reading Lloyd Hogan inspiring. I found reading Ivan Illich. A lot of people know him from his book, Deschooling Society. But there's another particular essay he wrote called Vernacular Values that I think is really, really an exciting piece if you want to think about the role that development plays in the world today. And also why it is that, that, that reclaiming subsistence economy is really useful. And I don't mean at a very, very low level where everybody is miserable and you barely are alive, but I'm talking about an economy that is rooted in meeting your needs rather than rooted in making a profit for somebody. And that's the, 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 the fundamental character of subsistence. And um, his writing on vernacular economy and vernacular language is, is, has been very profound and moving to me. The guy, Edward Baptist, that wrote the book, The Half Has Never Been Told, which is a kind of re-examination of slavery and the role that uh, slavery in the, in the, the Western world played in, uh, in building the current wealth and financial systems that exist. 
uh, as well as work by a guy named Gerald Horn. Gerald Horn is an African-American his historian at uh, University of Houston that wrote a book called The Counter-Revolution of 1776 that gives us a re-examination of the, uh, the, the, the war effort that took place from the point of view of the fear of the colonists here in the 13 colonies that Britain was about to end slavery and that this was really a, an effort to, uh, to help preserve the slave system over the new pronouncement that had come from London saying that the slavery had no role in British society. Mm. And there was a fear that that meant that they were going to quickly abolish it. It's a very, very fascinating uh, work, but his, his historical research is very, is very deep and profound and accurate, and I, I really love to read him as well. And there are a number of other young people. They're centers of thinking, like uh, the Boggs Center in, um, in Detroit, uh, that James and Grace Boggs left a legacy of people who continue to work and kind of support this building of a new and just society you know, along the lines of, uh, I mean, James Boggs was an auto worker, originally from Alabama, but who settled into Detroit uh, and became a kind of a, 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 an iconic figure within the revolutionary movement that developed uh, among mainly black, but more broader than that, auto workers in the, uh, in the 1960s and 70s. Then his wife, Grace Boggs, who was really a philosopher by training, yet continued in his work and built a center and did a lot of work with young people and reimagining the future. And I found uh, a lot of the work that they're doing, you know, really fascinating as well. And the last thing I wanted to mention is that I have become more and more convinced that we don't have to talk about revolutionary activity and building a just society and a new society and a new world off into the future. That we actually have some capacities to begin building it right now. And in fact, even building liberated zones, intentional communities where people build the kind of economy that they want, where they do have access to resources and access to kind of creating culture and building a meaningful life. And that, that more and more we ought to try to attract people to building these because I think that much of the existing, much larger economy, the economy at a large scale, is in trouble. It's, it's facing very, very deep crises. And that at some point it's going to be really important for us to begin building those models of what should an economy look like that some people will be able to learn from in the larger economy and emulate as we reconstruct what needs to be built after some of these larger structures that right now have been called too big to fail, do what it inevitably they will do, which is that they will fail. Wow. Ed, well, I just want to appreciate your perspective and connection to all these different centers of knowledge. You shared all these resources and, and, and thought leaders. Um, really appreciate that. And uh, also, I want to underline and amplify this, you know, the, as we title this podcast, Next Economy Now, I just want to agree with you. And it's our, our, our observation of what, as well. Next Economy is here uh, in terms of you can live that life. I'm celebrating 20 years as a worker owner this year. So I've only ever worked in worker owned mm. co-ops. Um, so I don't know any other way, right? Um, and that was a choice, a conscious choice. And uh, it's, a, it's a choice other people can make. Um, and so, you know, just really appreciate hearing uh, all the stuff you're involved with, which just shows the abundance of options that are there if people want to explore and, and learn about and get involved uh, with this work, it's, it's, it's happening. How could our listeners, how can they help you, Ed, in the, the projects you're working on? Is there, is there ways for, for folks to get involved that you, that you can share? If you check out the F4DC website, uh, there's some links there to some of the other work we're doing. I welcome people to come to Greensboro and come see the uh, Renaissance Community Grocery Store. It's a, very, it's a very beautiful store, and there's some very beautiful people who are working there. And you get a sense of, uh, of how excited people can be when they're able to do some things for themselves. And again, we are working toward building out this financial cooperative. So I think in the future, when some financial offerings are available in the very, very near future, there will be ways to invest uh, in that and make some of, of your access to wealth available for the people very broadly to build the economy, a kind of economy that is needed. Wonderful. So you'll, you'll hear from us soon. Very cool. Uh, any other final thoughts to leave us with? No, but just everybody should listen to more music and sing something. There it is, Ed. Real culture. Well, really appreciate you and your work and sharing sharing your your time with us today, Ed. And uh, yeah, we look forward to to keeping keeping track of these great projects as as they evolve. Well, thank you very much. 
X Economy Now is a production of Lyft Economy. To listen to all of our episodes, go to lyfteconomy.com slash podcast. That's L-I-F-T economy.com slash podcast. You can also sign up for our monthly newsletter at lyfteconomy.com slash newsletter. Please also rate and review our podcast on iTunes, Spotify, Stitcher, or wherever you get your podcasts. Thanks for listening.